In this video, I will be performing the suite in C minor by Matthias Weckmann. The suite has four movements, Allemande, Gig, Courant, and Sarabant with a double. A double basically denotes a variation, so I don't consider it a separate movement, but I will talk more about that in a bit. Since Weckmann is not known as well as he should be, here is some biographical information. He was born around 1616 in the small town of Niederdorla in the German state of Thuringia and died in 1674 in Hamburg. He first became a chorister at the Saxon court in Dresden, where he also studied with Heinrich Schütz and eventually moved to Hamburg, where he studied with the organist Jakob Pretorius. Through his studies with Schütz, he was introduced to Italian compositional styles, while in Hamburg he became familiar with the style of Zwelling, since some of Zwelling's pupils were living in Hamburg. During a second stay in Dresden, between 1649 and 1655, he met Froberger, with whom he became friends and maintained correspondence. Given their friendship, it is perhaps inevitable that Weckmann's keyboard music has been compared to that of Froberger. And if we look at many of what I would call mostly external elements of Weckmann's C minor suite, we can indeed detect certain similarities. The ordering of the movements, for example, is identical to that of many Froberger suites, and the length of the movements is also comparable. And even if we start exploring underneath the surface, we can still detect correspondences between the two composers. The Allemande of the C minor suite, for instance, has an introspective character and is permeated by a certain improvisational flair that seems to want to break away from the dance character of a traditional Allemande. These are characteristics we also find in many Allemandes by Froberger. However, if we continue our exploration and dig even deeper below the surface, then Weckmann's unique musical voice begins to emerge. And I would characterize this musical voice as hyper-expressive, in the sense that we frequently get very dramatic interruptions of the musical flow, and also in that Weckmann is willing to present very extreme gestures that almost overstep the boundaries of what can successfully work on a harpsichord. The Alemanda serves as a good example of Weckmann's unique expressive musical language. As I have already mentioned, it is permeated by the spirit of improvisation, which, as with Froberger's Almonds, presents a performing challenge in finding the right balance between the rhythmic flexibility suggested by its improvisatory elements while retaining the dance character of an Almond. To me, at least, this is one of the trickiest aspects in performing such a piece. Weckmann's more personal expressive touches are evident in the use of short gestures that seem to be suddenly interrupted by pauses, as well as the use of large leaps as a means of heightening expression. Both of these devices are used in the opening measures of the Alemanda, and let me play the first section Keep in mind what I just mentioned about those two devices, and then I will show you in more detail what I mean. But here is the complete first section of the Alemanda.
So very near the beginning, we have, for instance, one of those large leaps. So if I start again, so this, and if I continue, we get the other device, uh, the idea of separating gestures with pauses. So if I continue from where I left off, so, and this kind of idea, we can find it also in other parts of this first section. Uh, for instance, if I continue again from where I left off, so this, and continuing again, So this, and I tried to over dramatize it a little bit by lifting my hand away from the keyboard. Normally I wouldn't do that, uh, but I hope you can see what I mean. We have these, these gestures that are separated by these pauses. We have these sudden interruptions. Now, when we get to the beginning of the second section of the Allemand, then we get what to me at least is the most extreme, if I may call it that, example of using very large leaps. Uh, let me play that part. So this. And this is where I say that sometimes this is almost challenging to actually perform on a harpsichord and it's challenging because you have this large leap and at the same time because the left hand this has this kind of polyphonic dialogue we have this trill right as I have to play the F so I think the way to make this work at least the way I approach it is to try to delay that high F as much as I can because I want to create this expressive tension. At the same time, playing this, this trill has to be as leisurely played as possible because we're trying to make sure that this trill doesn't stick out and drown the high F. How well I can do it while I'm talking at the same time, I don't know. Um, I can probably do it better in the recording that you will hear. But let me show, show you that moment once again. So I try to delay this one and try to play the trill very leisurely. So I wouldn't do something like very fast or anything like that. So uh, to me, that's a very, very challenging spot. And really here, Vekman, I think, really pushes expressively uh, what can be achieved on the harpsichord. So it's a very difficult moment to, to play well. The tendency to write short gestures separated from each other by a brief moment of silence is also apparent in the jig, and especially its second section, which is permeated by two note gestures. What I would like to do here, just so that you can hear this, um, first of all, I want to play it much more slowly so that you have time to process these short gestures. And at the same time, because I don't want to stop every time and say, oh, short gesture here, short gesture here. I will try to over dramatize again the pauses by lifting my hands. Again, this is not um, good technique. It's simply, and think of it almost as sometimes actors will over dramatize when they play in silent movies. So I'm doing the same thing here just so that you can understand a little more how these gestures are constructed. So 
but I wouldn't I wouldn't actually play it like this normally. So. So you have all of these and I hope that playing it in this very exaggerated way at least gave you an idea of what is going on. Obviously, as I said, when I play it in, um, in the real performance, it's going to be much faster, but there at least you will also have the score so you will be able to see these um, gestures and how they're separated by pauses. Finally, a few comments about the saraband and its double. As I mentioned before, I regard them as a single movement. To begin with, this is because a double denotes nothing more than a variation. In this case, the main feature of this variation is to take the mostly chordal writing of the saraband and create different forms of arpeggiation or dislocation out of it. Let me show you what I mean. Now, one thing relating to performance here, um, as I mentioned, the, the saraband itself is basically all written out in block chords. So if I were to really play what I see, it would be something like this. As I've mentioned in other videos, when you see so many block chords, we can always think about arpeggiating some of them. So I think in the past I may have said something like arpeggiating almost everything, and that is not entirely correct. Uh, the idea is that when you see block chords, you have to think of them in terms of their expressive potential. And depending on the context, in other words, depending on the piece, you can say, okay, I don't want to play all of them as block chords, I want to arpeggiate some of them, but then also the arpeggiations should be varied. So here we have a saraband, meaning we have a slightly more expansive tempo, and therefore there is more opportunity for more arpeggiating. So for instance, I would play this in this way. So I'm not arpeggiating all of them, I'm simply arpeggiating a lot of them, but in different ways. And if you've noticed, I'm also adding a very, very, very slight touch of inegal. So I'm not going to get into the very thorny topic of whether we should be adding this kind of unequal note um, values in German music. To me, at least, this piece calls for a little bit of this inegalité, this kind of inequality, just a tiny bit. Um, but again, this is my, my interpretation. Um, so at any rate, the main, the real saraband is as I play this one. <laughs> etc etc and now when we get to the double what we're going to find is pretty much the same kind of harmonic progression 
and pretty much the same chords, only now they have been dislocated and arpeggiated, shall we say, by the composer. So the double is, the first section of the double sounds like this. Of course, those ideas that I mentioned before, first of all, um, short gestures separated by silence, it's still very much happening here, so... Um, and if I continue... So we just have this E flat, pause, E flat, so we have a lot, a lot of those silent moments there as well. And also the other idea that I mentioned about leaps is still here. And I would say we see this in the penultimate measure where we have a very dramatic and, and to me fairly extreme leap in the left hand. So... It's very dramatic because we're here. And of course, this is the part of the harpsichord that resonates more. So you get more sound out of it. And in addition, of course, Beckman is writing an octave, not simply a, a low C. So he's definitely emphasizing this, this very dramatic leap. Another reason I regard the double as a single movement along with the saraband is its extended coda, whose length is pretty much identical to that of an individual section in the double and the saraband as well. Such a long coda seems out of place if the double is seen in isolation, but if we regard it as a single unit along with the saraband, then it makes much more of a musical sense. And of course, it also serves as a fitting conclusion to the suite as a whole. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.